Jeff Power left New Mexico and followed his brother-in-law, Wiley Morgan, into Arizona. When he left, he left behind a court case that had charged him with falsely pretending to own property that he did not own. Uh, we don't know if he would have been found guilty or innocent. We just know he chose to leave New Mexico at that moment. Jeff Power started investing in mines, small mines, around 1907. And he was never spending a lot of money on them. And most people at this time just hoped that they could get a little return on their investment. They weren't exactly expecting to strike it rich. I think Jeff saw that the cattle ranching business was no longer for small independent far, um, ranchers, that instead it was increasingly going to go the way of the big corporate interests, just like mining in the state and farming in the region. And he was looking for a way to diversify and maybe just get lucky. Maybe he's going to make it rich. He knew as a small time operator, that was never going to happen as a rancher. But maybe he'd get lucky in gold mining. The whole area was mostly zinc and lead mining. There'd never been much gold found up there. And maybe he found some indications that there would be gold. But it's really one of the great mysteries of this story, why he thought this was going to be the jackpot for him. Jeff has always known a weak federal government. They were unable to throw him off the, the federal land in Rattlesnake Canyon. And now, I think he might have been expecting the same sort of response. If he said, man, I need these boys here at the mine working. You don't need them in the trenches of Europe. Take somebody else's sons. I don't think he really understood the ramifications of that. He wasn't in town enough. He wasn't around other people to really get a sense of how vital this was and how serious the government was now. And he didn't understand the power of the government had grown so tremendously in such a short period of time. It took a lot of people by surprise. A lot of people were surprised when they were arrested, deported, had their citizenship taken away from them when they failed to support the war to the extent that was expected. Ola May's death would have brought Robert Frank McVide and Jeff Power together in the same room. At this point, Jeff knows that McBride wants to bring his boys in for draft evasion. But he's grieving the death of his daughter in solitude with his family. He doesn't want to be dragged into an inquest, into inquiries. And it gets so bad that he doesn't even sign Olamay's death certificate. That function is performed by some official who fills out the form incorrectly. So he backs away from all this government intervention. And I got to imagine that he is telling his own boys, stay away from these guys. Stay away from the, the, the sheriff the government, let's just go back and mind our own business. Just as the investigation in Ola May's death is taking off, the federal government starts to issue warrants for the arrest of the Power Brothers on draft evasion charges. But they also state that they aren't just hiding out in the hills, but they're actually making threats against anybody who comes up to try and arrest them. The question in a lot of people's minds after this was, who are they making threats to? Where was this intelligence coming from? Their nearest neighbor was a half a mile to a mile away. And most of the people around town in the Gila Valley, where maybe this intelligence was coming from, really didn't know the Power Brothers. And you can tell by these same reports that were saying these men were threatening anyone with death, if they came up there, that the rest of the reports were full of errors. They misidentified family members. They said that Maddie Morgan was still alive when in fact she was dead for 20 years. They said that Ola May's name was Mary. So when you read through these reports, 
you wonder where the information was coming from that they were making threats to kill anyone coming to their cabin. Power family were casualty of the war, just like anybody else that died in the trenches. But I think another casualty of this war was freedom of speech, freedom to disagree, freedom to protest. And those are quintessential American rights that died temporarily during the war. There's a lot of regrets about this after the war. And all those prisoners that were sentenced to lengthy terms in federal prison were all paroled and released by the mid-1920s by President Warren Harding. Yet, the Power Brothers sat in jail for another 30 years because they were tried in local courts, in state courts, and were serving time in state prison. Nobody was willing to forgive their dissension.